for coming. Um, my name is Christine Adams and I am the chair of the Inglewood Leadership Exchange. And I'm really excited to um, talk about co-housing tonight. Um, I'll just give a, a, a very brief background about um, who we are and how we started. Um, when David was um, selected to be the executive director of the chamber a year and a half, two years ago now, um, we, I had, I had a kind of identified a need in our community um, for more, just more support for our small businesses. I work for the city and county of Denver, but I live in Inglewood and um, am just a consummate regular at all of my favorite places in Inglewood. Um, so I'm not necessarily in the business community, but I saw an opportunity for us to get give back and just to support our small businesses. And everybody I spoke to of all ages and in all industries felt the same. Um, and so David and I decided that we would create this Inglewood Leadership Exchange. Um, definitely not a young adult, uh, a young adult group because I am about to age out of a young adult group in like two months. So it's for everybody. <laughs> um, and so we were supposed to have a huge launch event in June, um, but COVID hit. And so we're just getting our legs under us now. And we've decided to do a monthly speaker series talking about new innovative things that we could potentially grasp onto and bring to our city. Um, Co-housing being um, our first topic for our speaker series. And I'm really excited to learn more. I only know a very little bit from David, um, but I'm, I'm really excited about the concept. Um, the goal, I think, of this group is to support the chamber, support our local businesses, but if there's something that really, um, that the group really latches onto, to kind of help move that forward and, and carry that initiative forward. Um, so with that, um, I will turn it over to David and the panel. This will be recorded, so we will be able to send it out or um, you can send it to whoever you want. Next time, bring your, your friends, your brother, my dog is here. Um, we're just trying to grow our group, but thank you for being here and thank you for our panelists for taking time to um, talk to us about this. Thank you, Christine. Um, well, welcome everybody. Uh, again, my name is David Carroll. I'm the executive director. And uh, I'll try to, as we start this conversation, I'll, I'll try to moderate a little bit and then we'll have time for question and answer. Um, I, I think these Zooms are uh, in, in one way, I know we're all a little Zoomed out, but uh, we're very lucky tonight in that uh, we get to hear from people that both believe and live in co-housing, uh, not only from uh, our state of Colorado, but also from California and Washington. So um, let me introduce uh, our panelists. Um, we have uh, Rain Cohen from Berkeley, California. I get that right, there's Rain. Uh, Trisha Becker, who's here in Colorado. So thank you, Trisha, for joining us. Or Trisha, I'm sorry, Trisha for joining us. And then uh, Anne from uh, Seattle, Washington. So near Seattle, yeah. Or near Seattle, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Bainbridge Island. I actually lived in Seattle for a little bit, so I kind of know a little bit of the area there. So thank you again for joining us and joining this conversation. Um, so I first heard about co-housing when I read uh, this book, uh, Brave New Home uh, by Diane Lind, uh, where she really talks about uh, the future of uh, kind of a smarter, simpler, and, and maybe happier way of living. Um, and maybe, maybe like many of you, and, and why this is interesting to the chamber is that um, when we talk about housing in, in the Denver metro area, we know it's uh, maybe harder and harder to find. Um, and uh, for all of us looking for new models of housing and, and how that uh, might be effective for us. And what I, you know, the little I know about uh, co-housing as well from reading and doing a little research that there are a wide range of living arrangements and it can be, um, they, they exist, I guess, in urban and rural uh, mixed use. They can be uh, senior living and multi-generational. Um, and so what I think we wanted to do tonight was just start a little bit of a conversation and uh, see where it goes from there. So I had uh, four questions I thought I would ask, and then we could uh, begin our Q and A if if we had anything after that. And so, uh, Rains, I thought I could start with you. Um, what 
kind of drew you to the uh, co-housing model? Uh, thank you, Senator David, for the opportunity and to get, uh, put, pull this panel together and the opportunity to connect around the, this topic. For me, I grew up uh, near Boston and came out to California to go to school and really felt being you know, thousands of miles away from family. Uh, that I, of course, I made friends here, but there's, there's a certain distance. And uh, for me, you know, recreating that feel of knowing your neighbors and community connection led me to co-housing first in Oakland, uh, nearby, and then at Berkeley Co-housing, where my wife Betsy and I moved here, uh, boy, uh, over 18 years ago. Uh, if you want to peek around, uh, it's, you know, cottages around a green, working with some existing structures and built some new, built on top of one and underneath another, and adapted to create a sense of community where you can really know your neighbors and, and, and live cleaner. And, and yeah, just it felt like it was aligned with my values, a great place to be an activist, to have space to have people over, to have my own private life, but uh, come home to a fresh cooked meal a few times a week. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it work, but worth it. And we'll talk about the, the, some of the challenges later, I'm sure. Thank you so much. And Trish, uh, Trish uh, shared with me a video that really, uh, you did a TED talk, I believe, um, and, and shared a little bit about the, uh, your desire to live in, a, in this kind of co-housing model. Do you want to share that with the group as well? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm talking about housing. Is my audio okay? Can you hear me? I'm connecting by phone to make up for some spotty internet. So um, my, you know, I was aware of co-housing um, for quite some time, um, but my journey there really started um, from a place of loneliness. Um, so we, you know, I, I lived communally, not in co-housing, but in, you know, various different group living situations for most of my life. And then my partner and I found ourselves in this big house in the suburbs um, and feeling really lonely and unnatural. Um, we realized that we had lived there for two years and hadn't ever been in a neighbor's home. And that just felt really strange to us. Um, so we were able to make the transition to co-housing um, and sign the contract within a week of finding out that we were pregnant with our first child. Um, and so it took, it was this really interesting time where we were explaining to our family and friends the decision to downsize um, at the same time that our family was growing and no one really understood that. And so we had to talk a lot about, well, this is really what we envision for our child. We want to raise them in community. We want them to know their neighbors and to have you know, all of these different representations of what adulthood can look like in morality and all of that. And we wanted the support. Um, so, and it's, um, it has proved to be that and so much more. Um, we felt really supported in new parenthood and um, everything from childcare to, you know, a glass of wine when I need to get out of the house and want to just walk down the hall in my PJs and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, that's, that's my journey and it's been a wonderful one. Oh, thank you very much. And Anne, you said you were in one of the, the first co-housing units. And right. You want to share what drew yeah, you? Yeah, well, Winslow Co-housing, almost 30 years ago, um, was formed from the ground up within the community by people who uh, reflect, you know, the things that Rains and Trish have talked about, you know, feelings of loneliness, wanting to be... Um, you know, closer to other people, wanting to have that be a normal part of life instead of an extra effort. And for me, um, I actually got involved in co-housing two different times. The first time, about 30 years ago, um, I had two young boys um, from the foster care system, and I could see the writing on the wall that it was going to be a hard thing to do and uh, stick with those guys because they had lots of issues. And um uh, so uh, we, I started attending the meetings, and at that time, there was nothing going on in co-housing, really, um, that we could kind of hang on to in terms of guidance. And um, it was very, very stressful. We had meetings once a week for, it seemed like, you know, a year or two. And, of course, that was hard, having uh, just being a single parent. And um, and then finally, there were times when it was just emotionally very trying. So at that point, I dropped out um, and um, we lived, you know, on our own for 10 years or so. And then um, 
as the boys grew up and went on with their lives, I just happened to get a foster daughter who was seven. Um, and again, you know, I thought to myself, I can't do this by myself, even more so than with the boys. And so I went to Winslow Cohousing just thinking, well, maybe I could just rent a house for a couple of years and just see how it works. Luckily, they didn't have any houses for rent, but they did have one for sale. So um, I was lucky enough to be able to buy a house in, in co-housing. And, and um, then my daughter actually um, became ill when she was about 16. And um, I was so grateful for community at that point. Uh, it was just such a blessing. And um, we, I did end up losing her. Um, which I could, just could not have done with any sense of equilibrium if I hadn't been in co-housing. So that was a real, a real boost to have that available to me. Thank you. So that, sure. that's how I got there. Yeah. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Did you know what I? What, one of the things that I saw that none of you have said. You all talked a little bit about community. It, is affordability a reason to be part of co-housing? Does anybody want to, or is that one of the disadvantages maybe? <laughs> a, a lot of people think of it as, oh, this has got to got to be cheap. But really, I mean, it costs just as much to build a condominium that's co-housing as any other similar time and material and location. You can get a little more efficiency because you can live in a smaller home and have more shared space. My wife and I are in uh, under 700 square feet in a one-bedroom home, but we've got the common house. We don't need the extra guest room. We don't need the laundry. Um, uh, we, for a really big, you know, meal, we can have it over in the common house, and so and the tools and so on. But much more is shared. Thank yeah, you. I would agree with that, and I think um, we we struggled with that over the years here. That um, you know, how do we make this work for people who have, you know, mo really modest incomes and um, I think things are going to change now that we have this tiny house movement. I think people are starting to think, yeah, we could actually live in a smaller space. And, um, uh, but I think the key is those shared facilities that Rain mentioned. That's just, uh, you got to have a place to do that stuff. And um, it, it's shared space. So that's complicated sometimes, but basically it's, it's wonderful to be able to share that space and not have to provide your own for everything. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, um, the next question I, I had and, and um, is really about, have you found any disadvantages of living in co-housing? And why don't we start with, since you were just talking, Anne, why don't we start with you and we'll go the opposite way around. Well, I think what I said uh, a little earlier was um, that I, I couldn't hack it in the beginning when, when they were, when co-housing here was just starting out. It was just so difficult. And um, I think that is yeah. typical. It, it was typical of um, many people who were in that first stage. And I've talked to people in other co-housings throughout the country who also found that to be very difficult. That, um, if you don't have a roadmap, it's tough. <laughs> and, and we were starting out um, from a point of um, wanting to have consensus. There were several Quakers in our meeting and we believed that that was really the way to go. But a lot of people in that group did not understand what consensus was and weren't able to make that adjustment. So there were really a lot of arguments about that. Um, so I think the, the emotional stamina of starting something new that's required in starting something new like that, which just is gonna dominate your whole life um, is kind of a downside, but I think the people who did stay at that time feel it was well worth it. And if you look around you know, what, to what we have, I, I would agree with that. But um, just generally, I would say that um, people who don't, if, if the group is moving toward consensus, people who don't understand it are going to have a hard time, and that makes it hard on everybody else. Um, at this stage, you know, we've, we've been doing this for so long that we think we know everything. And, um, you know, all of a sudden, in the, within the last year, of course, 
you know, COVID, but even more than that, in terms of our awareness of the world of people who have so much less than we do. And, um, uh, you know, just kind of causes us to confront what that means for us, you know, what, 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 how should we be treating each other? How should we be treating strangers who come into our midst? Um, if, if we don't understand their where how they got to where they are. And so there's been a, a, a tremendous amount of study over the last year about, you know, Black Lives Matter and, um, you know, things that help us understand the things that we all as a, as a country need to change. And so um, there's always learning and it's nice to have other people to do that with. Yeah, thank you very much. Trish? Do you yeah, I would, um, I would echo quite a bit of what Anne shared. Um, it does, it takes time um, and energy to be in community, more time and energy than it does to live in a single family home. Um, and yet the return on the investment is so great. You really get what you put in, in terms of, you know, you support one another and then you get that back. And, and it's incredibly rewarding to be part of a community that cares for each other so deeply. Um, the other two challenges are, Kind of a ma their macro level challenges that the movement really is dealing with. One of them, um, as you mentioned, is affordability. Um, it's just it's not um, accessible to, to many people. And there are, um, I think it's something that the movement is tackling and there's some promising um, advances in terms of like the um, urban land trust model, um, as well as I'm, I'm really speaking about co-housing, which again is just one point on, you know, we use kind of intentional community, um, but many times if, if you don't understand what co-housing is, you might lump them together, but um, there are some other structures like cooperatives um, that allow some, um, I'm just seeing in um, Rain's screen, yeah, that, I was like, that's my daughter. <laughs> there, that's, that's when she first walked that little video. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Um, so affordability continues to be a challenge. Um, and separate but connected is um, just a lack of diversity, um, racial diversity specifically. Um, but really the, the population that lives in co-housing tends to be pretty homogenous. Um, it does tend to be older, it's very white. Um, I think the generational dynamics are changing. Um, and then of course, um, in terms of socioeconomic status, um, pretty homogenous as well. So um, those are challenges that um, I think a lot of people are putting their minds around and hoping for for that to shift, so. Great, so it sounds like it's ever evolving at, at that time. Um, and, and maybe, uh, Rains, if you share yours and, and then uh, have a question related to oh, that. Oh yeah, really just, just briefly, I think you captured a lot of it. COAS has been called the most expensive personal growth workshop you'll ever take <laughs> because you learn a lot by interacting with your neighbors and having the shared meals and tasks and managing the condo association together. I like to think it was the most affordable postgraduate education you can find in housing development and community development. If you're lucky, you get a place to live out of it. And um, my wife, Betsy, calls it a better quality of problems, uh, problems here. We're worrying less about roofs and more about relationships. Yes, we maintain the roofs together, but we get help for that. But w w the time goes into understanding ourselves, maybe uh, in the process of understanding our neighbors and finding our common ground. And, and, you're, and finding your own uh, personal space and alone time. I mean, you have your own space, so I guess that becomes uh, is is available. But I guess that's when I heard when I share this with friends, they're like, "Oh, that sounds you know tough because I would need my own space." I, 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 think, I mean, in some ways, co-housing is not well named. Um, Eco Village carries the concept a little better. It's a, it's a neighborhood, private homes. It's a shared area, a common house. We all have our own kitchens, but meals together a few times a week. And I'm just right now out on my shared deck uh, with a neighbor gardening behind me. And another neighbor came over to see could uh, I be a backup person uh, while he was out to be his husband you know, with a kid at home. Uh, it's like, okay, good. We, we cover each other. So, so maybe as much as it is a built environment, it's, it's also maybe a, a philosophy on living and how you live together. Yeah. Uh, and, and as a result, it can be... Um, more affordably sometimes done with existing homes and retrofitting a neighborhood organic co-housing it's sometimes called 
and even the transition town model of work with your neighbors, figure out what you can share and build on what you have already in place. Could each of you, um, I'm sorry, David, I'm just yeah. right in there. Um, could each of you explain like what your model, your co-housing model looks like? I mean, this is so new to me that like, I'm not even sure like what this looks like. Could you just give me a little background on what your particular co-housing model looks like? And Anne, we'll go with you first. Uh, well, um, before I start, I'd just encourage you to go to cohousing.org because there's just that is full, just chock full of information that, that can answer some of your questions when we aren't here. Um, we have, as I said earlier, a consensus model, and uh, we have a board of five people, and um, they don't, they, I mean, they're technically the legal representatives of co housing, but <laughs> the board. If the board tries to pass something that uh, hasn't gone by the community, um, everyone complains. So um, we, we have clusters, uh, we have um, maintenance and uh, uh, grounds and administration and um, process and communication and also uh, facilities. So in those groups, a lot of the discussions about that are relevant um, to them, um, go on. And uh, so if if someone has a grounds issue, they would come, they, they would go to the, the head of the cluster um, and share it with that person. And that person would then share it with the cluster. And we would talk about whether we wanted to have anything to say about it or not. Or not. And then um, she would, the cluster coordinator would take that back to um, this other committee, which is called cluster coordinators. And um, if anything is of use, you know, something that if she needs input or feels the community needs input, then that's a good place to do that. And then once a month, <clears throat> uh, we have a general meeting, which of course now is all virtual. And um, it's just a really great opportunity to talk as a community and it's usually led by um well it's led by community members but um the issues that are presented um are a fairly limited number of people anyone could present but to get on the agenda you have to you know follow some guidelines and um typically the cluster reports go on at that meeting as well and in quite a bit of detail Thank you so much. Uh, Trish, do you want to share kind of? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the um, ARIA co-housing, which is the one that I um, helped found it's in Northwest Denver, that is um, the structure of these condos. So it's 28 condos, individually owned condos, and then we have several common spaces. So a common living room, dining room, big communal kitchen. Our condos are normal condos. They have kitchens, two bedrooms, two bathrooms than ours. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of misconception around, you know, is it a dorm? Does everyone have their own bathroom? Um, in most whole housing communities, it's individual homes, townhomes or condos are pretty common, um, maybe slightly smaller than average and then shared common spaces. Um, as far as governance, we have weekly, I'm sorry, we have bi-weekly meetings um, and then weekly meals. Um, before COVID at least, um, where we would rotate who would cook and we would sit down for meals. Um, that one, I'm actually transitioning out of that one. Um, our family is growing and we're actually going to be living with two generations above me. Um, and so that kind of gets at your next question, David, which I'll, I'll hold off on, but I'm um, about the intergenerational piece. So um, we'll have four generations um, of our family living together. Um, and so we had to transition elsewhere and so we're creating community in a different way now in Wheat Ridge um, and so what that looks like is kind of more what Reem was describing this like organic embedded community and it's something that I'm really excited about because it's taking the principles of co-housing and applying them in a different way so for us we will probably have five homes on a property um, and we will um, invite participation from the wider neighborhood um, so have common meals that are shared among 
the other folks on our street, the tool library, the skill sharing, a co-working space, that sort of thing um, kind of expanded. So it's a little bit of a different model, um, but I thought I'd share that just because I think that there's a lot of promise in that because co-housing is so wonderful, but it, it doesn't work for everyone and not everyone can sell their home and find a way into a and current or built forming community. And so I think that it's important to show pathways to communal living or elements of communal living um, for folks who can't make that decision. Um, and that's kind of what we're finding here in, in Wee Ridge. So. Cool. Thank you. And Range, do you want to share your thoughts on that? Uh, just, I mean, we actually here, we innovated for affordability and I know we had a bunch of um, at Berkeley co-housing, some, you know, single parents uh, in the formation of the community and the city uh, waived condo conversion fees. And uh, instead of making one unit super affordable, we made all the units moderate income affordable and agreed to caps on our prices for 30 years. Of course, the market has skyrocketed since then. So it's a big jump almost to the point where, boy, can I afford to leave? Can I afford anything else? Uh, but, but people have, there's been some turnover, but it's been pretty low with uh, a dozen years between resales. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've been, I've been part of organizing. This is what led me to regional organizing here in the East Bay in California to help people form new communities and find new ways, uh, including we're looking at mo uh, modular, pre-manufactured pre and tiny homes. And I mean, the whole, the star, our, by going, by embracing the condominium legal model has been a way to get the banks to finance it and to get something built. And, but now it's taking a different kind of innovation today, especially to um, get to bring in accessibility and diversity and yeah, to think about our, our need throughout our lives and, and the richness and potential to connect. Great, thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I think Christine had when she kind of presented this group that I really liked is this idea of kind of multi-generational learning and, and that uh, it wasn't just going to be a, a young professionals group that we would learn from each other as we moved along. And so that was really my next question where that came from is, can this model work as kind of a multi-generational living? And just since you have some kids and have had some idea on that, I thought that would be, we'll start with you and see. What's your thoughts around that? Sure. Um, yeah, the intergenerational element is one of my favorite things about call housing. So um, certainly some call housing communities are senior communities, but many are intergenerational. And that's the magic of it all. And I think that that's where, um, you know, each member brings something special. Um, and I, I certainly loved having, you know, having a child while living in community and having, we, we call them um, Cadence's aunties, you know, she was just surrounded by these loving um, people and the relationship was completely reciprocal. Um, so I think that that is built into co-housing, this like intergenerational connection. Um, I think actually, interestingly, David, in Brave New Home, Diana Lind um, proposes something that I thought was pretty cool um, about kind of you know, there's a movement within the single family home structure that now more and more we're looking for homes with ADUs or we're building homes that have like a separate wing for parents or for grown children, boomerang kids. So that's happening in the single family home world and yet not in co-housing. And so she was saying, you know, what if we built a co-housing community and each of the units had kind of an EDU or like a separate wing. And, and I thought that was transformational. I actually just emailed her about it because I was so excited about it. Um, and so that's, um, that's something that we're creating here. And, and just because ARIA, the community that we were a part of, didn't, didn't allow for that, the physical space just didn't allow for, for two more generations of families. And I think that's where the conversation of ADUs is really important. And I don't know how much, I don't know what regulations in Inglewood looks like for ADUs, but for those of you who don't know, ADUs are, you know, when you convert a garage or um, a basement or any time that you kind of take an extra space and make it a livable space and you can rent that, um, you can have family members live in it. Um, and I think that that's um, where we're seeing a lot of folks find a way to live intergenerationally. So um, I'm glad you're interested in that. And that's, that's really exciting. Thanks for, Thank you for putting that much. in the yeah, accessory building unit. And, and Sean, you might want to correct me, but I, I believe that Englewood has, is now allowing ADUs. Is that correct? 
Yes, that's right. In uh, late 20, actually early 2020, we allowed um, ADU. So the only thing is you do have to have um, the primary residence um, occupied by the owner. Um, yeah, and there are a couple of other regulations around that, but I think it's pretty standard. That, so citywide ADUs are approved mm -hmm. in Inglewood. That's excellent. Wow, that's really um, that's really forward thinking. <laughs> that's good to hear. Thanks, Sean. Anne, do you want to address the kind of multi generational? Sure. Um, well, I'm all for it, and there's quite a bit of that that goes on here. Um, there was a in a nearby city, Port Townsend, um, a senior co housing was. Uh, developed and built and I went to visit it <laughs> early on I just thought oh my god I could never live here all these people are old <laughs> of course now that I'm old um, I especially appreciate the young people around me and um, we were lucky enough to uh, to uh, um, attract families that had four four uh, different four different families that had three-year-olds uh, last year and, and that has been such a blessing because, of course, they're, you know, getting older and and developing like kids do. And um, so I, that is just priceless to me. And um, I've also seen a lot of support for older folks here in our co-housing. And I think that's a natural thing that happens also. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was thinking that not only the learning, but I mean, the care, right? I mean, it's probably there as well. I mean, the sharing in the community. Rains mm -hmm. to uh, yeah, I've been part of uh, helping create a senior co-housing and um, where people actually go through, it's developed in Denmark where this whole concept came from, a study group process of saying, okay, what is aging mean? What's likely to happen to me? How can I prepare? How can community help us organize? So I'm not gonna have to get shipped off to a nursing home so I can keep our independence through interdependence in community and uh, while that's going on here, we're, we're uh, with, with low turnover, of course, we're becoming a, a naturally occurring retirement community in North, uh, aging in community, not just aging in place. It's uh, with our low turnover, it's uh, we didn't you know, prepare at the beginning to say, okay, maybe we should make, make it easy to get into our homes without steps. How do we, when now we're talking about a ramp for the common house, uh, things that we, we started with existing buildings, so it was harder. Uh, we, we just went with what we could afford and what was important at the time. We're adapting as a community. We're prioritizing it now. And it's like, oh, somebody slipped. Let's, let's you know, get past the fight we've been having and get those lights up on the path and make sure that people are, are taken care of. I, I've never ceased to be impressed with our ability to cut through whatever is going on and make sure we're taken care of. But, but yeah, it, it does take a different consciousness. And some people are, are saying, okay, I've done the kid thing. I've done the work thing. Now what? And senior co-housing may be a good choice for them. Uh, but uh, it, it does, as was described earlier, it takes a village to raise a child and maybe it takes a village of kids to raise an adult. I like that. I like that uh, idea there. Um, and, and I don't know if this is, uh, it sounds like some of you have started uh, co-housing before. So really my last question um, before we open it up to everybody else was uh, how, how would a, a community uh, start something like this, and it, I, I'm guessing it it takes support from your your city on zoning and other things, or or maybe not. So, um, uh, how about uh, Rains? Do you want to follow up? I, I, I'll just start start it off by briefly saying you look for a place that's already zoned for multifamily housing that allows condos and yet isn't so valuable that some developer hasn't scooped it all up and gone for price for the sky. Sometimes co-housing groups can work on a smaller scale because we're less interested in profit. And maybe we can do something that politically we can get approved with the neighbors because it's not somebody else coming in to extract the value. It's us saying, hey, we want to be your neighbors. We want to be good neighbors. How can we relate? How can we connect and navigate that process more relationally, the more connected way? And, and yeah, there are uh, people can help them from the cohousing.org professionals out there and people from existing communities, of course, uh, with models. And there's no better um, way than get your, your planning officials, your, your city leaders, and even your potential neighbors for a site, come visit existing communities uh, virtually for now or in person when it's safe and 
see what's possible and get over these ideas in her head because people start to think, oh, uh, fraternities, oh, dorms, uh, oh, housemates, and have a whole different image from what it really is in the life. And so yeah, the more we can get people exposed, any place there's been one co-housing community approved, you'll, you'll generally see more follow. It's much easier once you're over that barrier. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Trish? Do you want sure, yeah. Um, you know, there's many different ways, whether it starts with a few interested people who find a developer and partner with them to create it, um, or um, if, if there's a group of people who are able to buy a, a piece of land that's already zoned properly and then they can serve as their own developer, um, and each of those routes kind of have pros and cons. Um, we, the property in Wheat Ridge, were, you know, purchased a residentially zoned property, and so we're in the process of rezoning, and um, it's challenging. I'm hopeful, um, but it's, yeah, it is, it is challenging. Um, I think the other important part for those who are in the early stages of thinking about forming a community is just to find one another. So in the co-housing world, we call them the burning souls, like the people who, like the, the small group of people that have a vision and believe in it and they do the work and then people start to come along. And um, we've, there's several of us in the Denver metro area that have recognized that there just is not an, a way for us to come together and access each other's resources. Um, and so we're actually just starting to kind of bring folks together. We're having a gathering in a couple weeks. I'll pop my email in the chat. And if, if anyone's interested, um, we're doing a little virtual gathering. Um, welcome to come or, or spread the word. Um, because we're looking for ways, you know, for people to be able to connect to resources. Certainly coho.org is a great resource. Um, another one is the um, Foundation for Intentional Community, and their website is ic.org, um, and they have a lot of great trainings for folks who are like, I want to start this, what do I do, what, you know, help me understand what a developer understands in terms of budget and governance and zoning and all of that. So um, there are resources out there for those who are interested. Great. Thank you very much. And Anna, I know when we were chatting over email, you said, you may not, but it sounds like you were in the beginning of starting one in the yeah, past. I was. Um, I suddenly seem to have more to say than I thought it would. But uh, um, I think the the driving force, it, it really is the most productive if there's a small group of people who really, really, really want to do this. And um, I don't know how much can be done you know, at the city level, although it would have been nice if the city had been a little more open at the time, but um, I, I think that, that that core group is really important. At, at the same time, um, I have come across a couple of co-housings that had a core group, but it was dominated by one person. And um, that has had a 30-year effect on a couple of co-housings that I, I think is unfortunate. So, you know, right away there needs to be um, talk about and, um, you know, some kind of processes developed for how you deal with conflict. And, you know, and that might just mean you want your house to be a different color, you know, than everybody else's or than somebody else wants. So th those, those things are really helpful to get out of the way in the very beginning. And um, cohousing.org has just a myriad of articles about stuff like that. And I think it's well, well worth accessing. And, I, and I've also found that, um, you know, Rain's mentioned um, consulting, getting a consultant. And for a long time, I was really kind of against that because it seemed like co-housing was, it's really just about this group of people who want to do something. And then part of the, important part is them figuring out how to do it and that's going to have lasting effect but I feel differently now I think it's really helpful if um, if particularly people who are kind of inexperienced and want to get going quickly um, to have a consultant that can help um, or even a consulting group I mean there's all, all varieties of of consulting for co-housing thank you Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I know we are, uh, we, tr we try to keep these meetings to about an hour. So we've got about 15 minutes. I had some questions in my head, but I was gonna open it up <laughs> to everybody else in case they had questions first. And 
and go from there. If you want, maybe just we're a small enough group, you can raise your hands or if you don't have a good uh, video, I can um, look for hands, raised hands up here. Steven, I can't find the raised hands, but um, yeah. I do have to run to another engagement, but I've really enjoyed this and look forward to hearing more about it. Great. Thank you, Thank you Sean.